Okay, so um, one of the things I've, I've struggled a little bit with, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the, the transition from Mizzou here, is you know, y'all are new to me mostly. Um, I've run into a few of you at, at various uh, K-State sort of events, but um, helping gauge this um, uh, knowledge and, and comfort level um, was a, a good exercise. And um, so there may be some stuff in here as we go along that uh, um, some of you might go, well, that's pretty dang remedial. Um, but one of my things, um, or one of the, my objectives, um, was to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. Okay? So I think one of the, the most um, um, either important or um, potentially detrimental things is as we go out as extension educators, um, if people get mixed messages from us, um, I think that does um, um, uh, us collectively not a lot of good um, and certainly uh, provides our clientele with uh, um, some opportunities to make uh, uh, some expensive mistakes. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is, is make sure we're all on the, on the same book in the, in the hymnal, okay? Or the same page, anyway. Um, one of the things I didn't do in the first part because I didn't think it, it fit very good in, in a Q&A session is um, I know some of you kind of gotten to know me a little bit and I talked a little bit about sort of my, my area of expertise I'm staking out is kind of genetics, obviously. Um, but a little background, I grew up on a, a cow-calf operation in southeast Colorado. Um, we had a few registered Hereford cows and, and mostly uh, commercial black baldy cows. Um, uh, undergrad, at, uh, um, I was lazy last night when I got home from Kansas City, so I just took these Olson scene. These from the interview seminar. I just cut and pasted them right in here. Okay. Um, uh, undergrad, master's work uh, at Colorado State. Um, worked for five years at the American Gelfie Association um, in education and research programs. Um, and so my uh, um, uh, tasks at, uh, yeah, I had hair back then. Pretty cool, huh? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This, this guy right here is me, yeah, middle guy, yeah. Uh, the um, um, job tasks there were sort of uh, breed improvement, uh, genetic evaluation programs, commercial marketing activities, and uh, youth programs, so managing the junior board, junior national, all that kind of stuff. Um, a great experience. Um, as time went on, we had uh, two different, uh, I guess three different executive directors during that period of time, and they went from uh, expertise in animal breeding and genetics and uh, to one that didn't have any expertise in animal breeding and genetics. And so my job description um, uh, changed pretty substantially during that period. Um, and because of that, I took a couple of classes in, in animal breeding and genetics at CSU, um, just sort of as a, a professional development exercise. Um, but what I found was I really liked um, the topical area quite a bit. Um, you know, I'll tell a little story on myself as an undergraduate in animal breeding class. I got a C. Um, it wasn't something I was really interested in. Um, but um, um, certainly in that, that job experience, um, I basically managed the genetic evaluation system and the record keeping system at, at AGA um, and, and developed a lot of interest um, in those programs. And maybe most importantly, um, kind of a passion for helping producers, both seed stock and commercial, understand genetic improvement tools. Um, and so in a lot of ways, that was a great training ground to be an extension specialist, okay? Um, uh, because of that uh, experience and interest in genetics, I decided to go back to, uh, back to school um, and did my uh, uh, graduate work in genetics on Pollock at Cornell, um, which was a, an interesting cultural and agricultural experience all by itself. Um, but uh, finished there in uh, um, fall of 04. And um, um, while I was there, though, I worked part-time for American Simmental and their breed improvement program. Cornell did their genetic evaluation. And so it was kind of a nice transition for a guy that had a regular full-time job to uh, not be a poor graduate student entirely. Um, but a really good experience um, uh, working for, uh, for ASA. And uh, then joined uh, University of Missouri's Animal Science back in 2004. Um, that's where I got to know Dr. Olson. Um, he was on faculty there and, uh, of course, started here um, this past fall. I do a, a fair bit of uh, um, consultancy work for a variety of groups um, on a range of issues from basic uh, kind of diagnostics and genetic evaluation systems um, for a couple of breeds. Um, one of the things these uh, breed associations have run into is there's not a lot of people trained um, in animal breeding that have um, large-scale genetic evaluation experience. 
um, and have association experience to be able to kind of uh, uh, both provide the educational material, um, but certainly the diagnostics and, and follow-up work post-evaluation um, as they get ready to release that data. Um, so limousine, uh, main and Jew and Kenny, there'd be three clients I assist with that uh, exercise. Um, but do some work um, um, for a couple of uh, genomics companies um, in uh, both some research stuff as well as uh, educational tool development. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, um, I also think is really important for, for state specialists is to pro provide and build a, a repository of tools um, uh, that should be useful for you all. And so um, uh, I'll continue to populate uh, our animal science website uh, with a variety of these tools um, to make it convenient for you to gather up. Um, but a few I wanted to make you aware of, the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium is a, a group I work with on the national level for extension programming. And uh, many of you may have participated in our recent Brown Bagger series. Uh, if you missed that and are interested in some uh, genomics kind of topics, um, those programs are all archived uh, through Adobe Connect. Um, we use the, actually the K-State Adobe Connect system this year, and so you can go out to the NBCEC website and go to the For Professionals um, section, which is specifically designed for extension educators, um, and you can archive not only this year's series, but uh, uh, slide sets and recordings from previous years as well. Um, we do, uh, uh, a couple of us, uh, Matt Spangler at Nebraska and I have been active in uh, the e-extension group. Uh, for beef cattle and provide some uh, genetics-based webinars um, uh, for that group. And those are also archived if you go to this extension.org slash beef, and that's underscore cattle, um, and look for the archived webinars. You can find some materials um, there as well. These are principally targeted um, at, uh, at producers, so they're, they're a little bit different level of expertise than the, the NBCEC ones, or level of material anyway. Um, the... Um, uh, other things I've got uh, recently stuck up on the, the animal science site. Um, one of the things that's a challenge for a lot of people trying to make different breeding decisions or breeding decisions, decisions using different breeds is understanding the relative genetic merit of those breeds. And so one of the most effective ways to do that is use the uh, Clay Center, Meat Animal Research Center, crossbreed EPD adjustments. Um, the challenge with that is, is that unless... If Angus is the breed that you're most familiar with, they're the sort of what they call the base breed, everything else gets adjusted to Angus, okay? Um, that's great if you understand Angus, but if you happen to be a Simmental breeder or a Hereford breeder or familiar with those tools, um, you may actually want it on a different base. You may want it on the Simmental base or the Hereford base, and that requires actually a fair bit of sort of forward and backward math to get that done. Um, I've got an Excel spreadsheet that you actually just specify what base the animals are on and what base you want the resultant EPDs on, and it does all that behind the scenes. So you just fill in the animal ID and the base, and it makes the conversion for you. Um, so it's a, a pretty convenient tool, and I update that every time there's a, a release of uh, data from Meat Animal Research Center with new adjustments. Um, that's a tool that got used quite a bit over in Missouri and, and hopefully will here too. Um, and then the other one's uh, adjusted birth weights, winning weight, yearling weight calculator. So if you've got clients um, that are making, uh, uh, collecting performance data and trying to use that in a selection process, um, going through the effort of actually adjusting those uh, records for age of calf and age of dam is a pretty useful one, particularly as we think about replacement female selection. Um, and so it's a little calculator that uses the BIF adjustments to do that as well. And so it's a, a, a much simplified way of uh, trying to help those guys versus doing it on the back of your big chief tablet. Okay, um, ksubeef.org get you right to that material. Okay, um, an overview of where, uh, where we'll go today. Um, one of the things I want to make sure everybody's um, comfortable with and, and from the, the previous screening most everybody I think is um, with some of our basic selection tools um, and why we use um, EPDs as the principal measure of genetic merit, but we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I want to give you a little bit of ammunition and motivation why why EPDs are so important for our selection systems and uh, some maybe demonstration that they actually work um, and what they can and can't do. And then um, uh, we'll talk, talk a little bit about multiple trait selection. I know we've had a couple of comments on selection index already. Um, we'll talk about that. And... Um, um, sort of where, where EPD technology is going. And 
I'm, I know the room was pretty packed at the, um, the little room we had at annual conference for my talk. How many of y'all sat in on that? I was thinking three or four of you, so. Um, so we'll, we'll cover some of that ground that may be a little repetitive for you guys, but uh, hopefully good information. Um, some guide, guiding principles I, I like to keep, as I mentioned before, things relatively basic, which I know coming from an animal breeder may be a little oxymoronic. Um, but um, um, I think uh, some of these are really true, um, particularly when applied to genetics. So um, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, or manage it. Um, I've heard routinely people complain about you know, body condition score, cow size, or calf weights, yet they don't collect any metrics associated with those in their cows, so it's pretty hard to make change. Um, uh, you know, one of my, my arguments with uh, folks in Missouri was they'd talk about cow size, and then I'd say, well, how much do your cows weigh? And then the immediate response was, well, I don't know, I don't weigh them. So, you know, the best way to figure out how much they weigh is actually go do it and not guess. Um, not all traits should be measured. I'm not one of these uh, um, uh, performance record guys that thinks you should measure either on commercial or seed stock cows every piece of data on, under the sun. Um, there are some that are really important to our, our economic progress and some others that aren't. Okay? Um, uh, I have a firm belief that populations respond to selection and they will respond to selection in the environment in which they live. Okay? Um, so one of the things I think a lot of our, our producers tend to do is instead of modifying the cows, they modify the environment, okay? And that's a great way to select cows that fit in the modified environment, okay? Um, if you want a cows to work on range in a low input environment, put them in it and start selecting, okay? I mean, it, it's, it's not any more complicated than that. And I know. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Um, selection without an objective that includes profit is called a hobby. Okay, um, one of the, the the biggest challenges I think most of, of um, some smaller producers that have how should I politely say this smaller producers that have non farm income um, try and come off as um, being very economically motivated. And certainly there there are some, um, but there's some other ones that make just really. Um, insane investments in their cow-calf operation and try and push, and I'm thinking some seed stock producers, and push that off as what the state of nature for the rest of us should be. And I kind of take some ob objection to that. So um, selection without an objective that includes profit is a hobby and should be treated as such. Okay? Do not file a Schedule F. Okay? Um, sire selection should address additive and non-additive merit. Um, I think... You know, I, I even fall subject to this once in a while. We think about making genetic improvement in a variety of traits um, through only within breed um, selection, um, and that's a that's a fallacy because there's a whole bunch of traits that improve dramatically um, through crossbreeding and, and use of heterosis, and those traits include reproduction, which is one of the most important economic traits in our cow calf operations, and one of the best and fastest ways to improve herd level reproductive efficiency genetically. Is through crossbreeding. It's not through within breed selection. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of propaganda out there about you know how much progress we can make within breed. And blah, blah, blah. it's crap. Okay, um, there's uh, um, appropriate use of, of genetic resources, um, and that includes using both additive for the EPD based genetic improvement, plus all the stuff we know that responds to additive merit or non additive merit. Okay, crossbreeding. So. Get soapbox off, okay? Um, the um, um, sire selection tools we have available um, sort of span a spectrum of both utility um, and um, cost, okay? So by utility, I mean ability to generate a response to selection, so increase, decrease, stay the same. Um, those are, um, that describes the effectiveness or efficiency of those tools. Um, and also cost, okay? And I've ordered them here from um, uh, least effective um, and least cost to, I hesitate to say most effective, but most effective and highest cost, okay? Um, and I say most effective because these DNA markers do a very good job describing the genetic variation that they're associated with, okay? Um, and we'll talk more at the end of the talk, but there's a substantial difference between this tool inability to account for genetic merit at this point in time, and this tool, okay? Um, both of them um, are described, described 
differences in genetic merit. Um, the difference between them is EPD describes the summation of all the genetic effects for a trait and interactions between genes. Okay, so it's the net effect. DNA markers describe a subset of that variation. Okay, so they actually describe variation associated with a specific candidate gene or region on the genome. Um, and so they're only effective for the stuff they're associated with. If there's a whole bunch of genetic variation in the population or across the genome for a particular trait where we have not discovered the DNA markers, those tools do not do you any good for that amount of variation. Okay? Um, and there's a big gap right now between the DNA marker tools are getting much, much better, um, but there's still a big gap between the effectiveness of this tool and the effectiveness of this tool okay? when applied directly. Um, we'll talk later about the strategy of actually merging these two pieces of information, and that was a bulk of the talk I gave at uh, annual conference was talking about that. But the most effective way to use this information um, so it's not disjoint um, or provides conflicting results with the EPD data is actually push those together, okay? Um, so that we use the DNA markers to describe the genetic variation for the genes that they are associated with, and we use the EPD to soak up everything else, okay? Um, but as we think about uh, uh, application, either at the commercial or seed stock level, these all have different uh, effectivenesses um, or levels of effectiveness um, and differing costs. And in not all cases do we need to calculate an EPD or use a DNA marker to make some kind of selection progress. Okay? It depends on the context in which we're applying um, a specific um, a selection strategy, which one of these tools is most important. And we'll contrast move ahead here and what some of the problems are with some of the data. Um, I mentioned earlier um, uh, a little bit about uh, you know, including lots of actual performance data in sale catalogs, for instance. And um, um, there's, there's a real fundamental problem with that, using it for selection for genetic improvement. Um, and that stems from the fact that um, those raw performance observations, I hesitate to even call them phenotypes, because they haven't been adjusted for any of the other sources of variation that we know affect those measures, okay? Um, so if we think a trait like weaning weight, um, we can influence weaning weights of calves um, within a group by changing management or the feed availability. Um, certainly differences in age account for differences in, in observed weaning weights. Um, sex of calf, um, age of dam, um, climate, and certainly differences in genetics across a herd all influence um, actual weaning weights, for instance. So using those unaccounted or using those tools for selection when we have large amounts of unaccounted variation biases our selection decision. So um, I don't, um, there's not many cases or many traits where we should actually use a raw performance measure as an indicator of genetic merit. In fact, I can't try and think of one here in my head and I can't think of a single one. Okay, so um, any selection decisions based on raw data is uh, uh, flawed. Um, adjusted data is somewhat better because um, the data gets adjusted for known sources of variation. Okay, um, things like age of calf, age of dam, sex—you know—all the things we think about when we adjust, say, weaning weights. Um, those get uh, uh, adjusted, and so it kind of cleans up um, the between calf variation for those known sources of, of uh, variation that would bias our decision. Um, and our objective then is to start comparing the apples to apples. So, you know, adjusted measurements give us a decent tool, at least within, say, a, a contemporary group of calves, um, to evaluate some differences in terms of genetic merit, but they're not perfect. Okay? Um, ratios are really just a transformation of the adjusted data um, to reflect differences from average. Um, and they work okay, as they're, they're just as effective as adjusted data in that regard. Um, and just give us, you know, above 100 or below 100 index value for those animals um, based on their own performance. Um, but the, the challenge is these are okay within group, but when we go outside of group, um, a contemporary group, they're less effective. When I say, con does everybody know what contemporary group means fundamentally? So it's animals that have all been given the same opportunity to perform. Um, so they've had similar management in terms of animal health products, um, maybe growth promoting implants, nutrition, all of those sort of things are similar. Um, and when we do that, our, our fundamental assumption is if animals all have the same environment to perform, the differences we observe between their performance records then is due to genetics. Okay, um, that's the, the fundamental tenet of genetic evaluation. Um, and so one of the problems is, as we move outside of a contemporary group, 
um, we cannot use ratios or adjusted measures to make comparison because we haven't accounted for differing levels of management that were um, applied to that whole unit of animals. So, you know, Olson and I um, might have cows of the exact same genetics, say, um, but I sort of, you know, um, provide a lot of supplement, a real easy environment for our cows. My calves are going to weigh more than, because I know Casey's going to, you know, least cost do it and um, kind of rough the cows along and make them work for him. Um, we do expect a, a substantial difference, say, between weaning weights of our calves, even though we have the same genetics. So if we wheeled in, you know, if you're a producer and buying bulls and you wheeled into my place and Casey's place um, to buy genetics, and you used ratios or uh, adjusted data um, to, um, uh, or adjusted weaning weight, say, to make that decision, you would probably prefer my genetics. Well, you would prefer my management. Our genetics were the same, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So we can't use these adjusted measurements or ratios to compare animals between herds or across years very effectively. Um, and that's where EPDs come in because they really allow us to separate this wheat and chaff um, sort of issue of differences in um, uh, performance due to environment. Um, and it accounts for a whole bunch of stuff besides the sort of what we call fixed effect things in terms of age of calf, age of dam, sex, all of those sort of things. And it leverages information from a variety of sources. And you all know this. Um, pedigree information, an individual's own performance record. Um, information on progeny. Um, we use correlated trait information, so we know birth weaning and yearling weights are, are genetically correlated, and so we use data from those sources to inform our uh, other EPDs. And the bulk of the effort then is to remove these environmental effects so that we can use them uh, across herds and across environments to make effective selection decisions. Okay, um, one of the things I think, um, um, and it took me a while when I was at Mizzou to sort of put this slide together, but I think it's really important that we think about what EPD actually means. It's, it's fundamental to the, the, the correct application of the tool um, to understand what it really means. And so we'll go through this in, in a couple of different ways um, uh, that I think are, are useful and informative. Um, first, we'll deconstruct what EPD means. It's expected progeny difference. And this largely comes from uh, the term actually comes from its statistical derivation, okay? The origin of, of EPDs um, uh, came from a, a field of statistics. Um, and so the expected part of it actually um, is used to describe, when we talk about expectations and statistics, um, we actually, you can exchange, you can put mean in instead of expectations. Um, so it has a connotation of average or mean, um, which we'll see in a second is really important. Um, progeny um, is uh, the target, so we're trying to use the tool to describe differences in performance of calves that are resulting from those decisions uh, or selection points. Um, and difference implies this comparison between animals. And I think difference is, is the most important operative word in this because it doesn't tell us anything about what the phenotypic performance of, of a, an animal is or a set of animals, a set of progeny between bulls, um, it tells us what to expect between um, those groups. So it's, it's a, it is a numeric difference, and it implies this comparison between animals. Um, and those differences are relative across the herd or across the population um, uh, when we talk about EPDs. Okay? They don't tell us anything about phenotypic performance. And the reason for that is in the genetic evaluation, We've adjusted out all of the environmental stuff that we can, that we know about, out of that decision. So it just, you know, it takes environment out of the perspective, and we know environment accounts in a lot of traits for a majority of the variation between animals, right? So if we talk about heritabilities of traits, heritability describes the proportion of variation in a trait that's under additive genetic control in the narrow sense. Um, and so a trait like um, marbling, for instance, has heritability somewhere around 0.4, which means 40% of the variation between animals is due to genetics. That also means that 60% of the variation between animals is due to environment, okay? Um, and it's because of that adjustment out of environment in our EPD calculations that we don't, it doesn't say anything about phenotypic performance. It just talks about the relative difference in that performance, okay? Um, I think one of the, the sort of twists on what EPD means is we can think about EPD as describing the average effect of an animal as a parent, 
That's what, uh, that's what it does statistically. But it, another interpretation is that it's an estimate of the average gametes genetic merit for a particular trait. Um, so if we think about, um, um, uh, say, an AI bull produces, you know, maybe a thousand straws of semen that we get uh, to make cows with, um, the EPD's objective is to describe if I've got an average sperm cell um, from that bull's collection for weaning weight, what does that represent in terms of genetic merit? Okay, and that I think becomes pretty useful interpretation because one of the things we know in, in an argument that producers frequently use um, against the use of EPDs is that um, I make a selection decision for a bull and I still have huge variation in my calf crop from a particular bull. Um, and and that's, uh, that's sensible from both a genetics and a statistics perspective in that we know if, if a bull's got an EPD estimate of, say, 40 here for weaning weight, we know some of the sperm cells that that bull produces get a great assortment of genetics for weaning weight through random assortment during uh, uh, meiotic cell division. But we also know that there's some of those sperm cells, they get a really crappy assortment just by chance of genetic material for weaning weight. Well, what happens if this sperm cell fertilizes an egg in a cow? That calf's going to be pretty good. What happens if this one fertilizes an egg? He's the knothead at the bottom, right? Um, and so one of the important take-home messages is, is EPD, remember the expected part means mean. EPD describes the average genetic merit of those sperm cells. It does zero communication about the expected variation in the genetic merit of those calves or the phenotypes that result from those calves. EPDs only describe mean differences, okay? Skip that one. Um, so if we've got uh, two EPDs that are um, uh, two bulls here, the red, the red bull and the blue bull, the red bull has an EPD of 40, say for weaning weight, and the blue one has an EPD for 50. When I tell you they've got a 10 pound difference, or I do the subtraction there, and there's a 10 pound difference in those bulls EPDs, that means that we expect the average calf performance between those two bulls, if we had a calf crop and we divided them up into two sire groups, weighed them up, and they're in the same production environment, that there'd be 10 pounds difference in the averages uh, of those two sire groups. But we also know that if we inspect those contemporary, or that contemporary group and those uh, particular uh, calves, we know that the inferior bull here, the one that had the 40 weaning weight EPD, actually produces some calves um, that are actually quite good and actually better than the average um, of this bull that was at 50. And vice versa, um, the, bull, you know, the blue bull produces some calves that are below the mean of the red bull. Um, the key thing here is that, again, the EPD describes the relative difference between these two progeny groups. Okay? Does that help make EPD a little more tractable at the, the genetic level? Does that make sense to everybody? I'm, I'm a lefty, and so pictures like this mean a lot to me. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully it gives you a, a little different view on um, you know, sort of this expected variation within a calf crop, um, but also um, that we're talking about the average. Okay, um, so one of the key things too as we think about relating um, EPDs and DNA markers together is that um, EPDs describe the cumulative or net effect of all the genes and the interactions of those genes on a particular trait. So we know in, in traits like weaning weight of economic importance to beef cattle, there may be several hundred genes that affect variation in that trait. And the, the molecular data has become clearer and clearer every day um, that there may not be just several hundred, there might be four or five or six hundred genes that play a role, um, an important role in um, a trait like weaning weight. And the challenge is that each one of those genes then only accounts for a very small amount of individual variation. Okay, So we have to aggregate those measures together to get a meaningful picture of genetic variation. So here's illustrated a bunch of different markers and genes uh, on chromosomes for a particular animal. The EPD tries to sum up well, it uses the phenotypic data as an aggregate um, to infer what the net effect of all these genes is, okay? If we flip that around and we think about DNA markers, um, let's say just this top part is, is a panel of DNA markers for weaning weight. Um, if we only had this amount of information and summed up those effects to what we call a molecular breeding value, how is that then related to the EPD? Okay, does it describe, describe the same amount of variation? Same genetic merit? Or different? If we've only got this, this, this set's not marked, this set is. 
we calculate an MBV here, we've now got a part whole relationship, right? Um, between the EPD and the MBVs. Okay. And one of the challenges with our, our clients is, is that they take the MBV data as describing all of the genetic variation in a trait. And unfortunately, that couldn't be further from the truth. Okay. Um, and so when they make a selection decision and they use the MBV data exclusive of the EPD data, they're likely to make a mistake because this information, the genes that aren't in the marker panel, have not been accounted for. So early on, we saw lots of cases where an animal might be selected because he was, you know, eight star or something for marbling, um, but he was in the bottom 30% of the breed for marbling EPD. If you selected that bull to improve marbling in your herd based on the molecular data, you just made a giant mistake, okay? Um, so it's really important to understand those fundamental differences in the two tools and how to use them. Um, the, um, um, this is going to be really, really simple, but the, it's in here as a, as a principal reminder for if we make a, a decision here between, say, 878 and 9015, I know these aren't current EPDs for these bulls. This slide's several years old. Um, but we'd expect about a 16-pound difference um, in the favor of strategy for weaning weight performance if we mated those two bulls to a big group of cows. Okay. Um, what can you guys tell me about, though, this bull relative to these two? That's exactly right, and that was, that's the reminder here is that little Excel spreadsheet with the crossbreed adjustments would allow us to make that comparison. But in terms of raw data, we certainly can't do that, or raw EPDs, um, we can't do that. Um, EPDs fit in selection. One of the things I, I hear from uh, uh, our, our customers out in, in the country is, well, I don't have any proof these EPDs actually work. And they're using that variation in calf crop as their principal ammunition um, that, uh, that EPDs don't work. And certainly that's not a majority of producers, but there's a, a small and vocal group that, that subscribe to that belief. And um, uh, my advice is uh, don't, don't let them derail your discussions. Um, so be sure you know who you're calling on when you call on them. Okay. Um, the... Um, um, Data suggests that EPDs are about seven to nine times more effective in generating response to selection, so controlling genetic variation um, and the resulting phenotypes than uh, actual performance records are because they've accounted for all that difference in, in environmental effects. Um, and that one of the key things, and this is, is obvious to all of us in the room, hopefully, is that EPDs can be used to increase, decrease, or maintain performance. Okay, um, and I'll talk about that more in just a second, but we can use EPDs to make weaning weights heavier. We can use weaning, uh, EPDs to make weaning weights lighter. Um, we can use EPDs to keep weaning weights the same. Okay, it's all a matter of how we use the tool in our selection decisions. Um, one of my principal pieces of advice almost always in a discussion with a producer about selection for any trait is understand the nutritional limitations of your environment um, and seek to optimize that genetic potential to that environment with minimal supplemental nutrition. Good advice, Olson? Okay. Um, this plays a huge role, and in many of our breeds, I'll show you some slides in just a minute, we've dramatically changed genetic potential for a lot of traits, not the least of which is mature weight and lactation. Okay. These lines go pretty much the same direction. We've been trying to, or Angus breeders have selected for heavier yearling weights. Let's try another trait where they haven't made this kind of linear selection, okay? I did having relative differences between all of the animals born, say, in 1980 and 1981, okay? That's the relative difference. So I think, you know, buying, if you're not an EPD believer before this, hopefully, I mean, this is, I can't think of a clearer example of better evidence that EPDs work on a population scale than this. And if somebody else has a good idea, I'd be sure glad to hear it because I'm trying to gather up as many of those kind of examples as I can. Um, the other thing I promised you was a little bit of discussion that, um, you know, breeds have changed genetic merit dramatically over time um, through selection and principally through selection using EPDs. Okay, so this is uh, the genetic trends for birth weight of two, three, four, six, seven, eight major U.S. beef breeds. So Angus, Red Angus, Hereford, Charlet, Gelby, Limousine, Maine Anjou, and Simmental. Okay, what I've done is made as apples to apples comparison here as I can. 
I took these genetic trends from all these breeds and used the across breed adjustments from US Meat Animal Research Center to put them all on the Angus base. So this is a head to head comparison in genetic merit for birth weight as we can make. Um, this data was put together in 2009. The trends are relatively similar today. I need to update it, but uh, as you might guess, this is a pretty big pile of work. Um, but it describes, here's Angus and Red Angus, um, and they certainly have an industry reputation of being sort of the two low birth weight breeds. Um, Limousine, Hereford, uh, and Simmental here. Um, so you see slight decrease in birth weight in Simmental. Um, Maine Anjou and Charlet. So they're by and large flat, but uh, a little bit of trend. Um, this is weaning weight, okay? Same, same exercise, crossbreed adjustments, genetic trends across breeds. Um, and it spans from 1985 to uh, 2007, so about 22 years. And uh, what you see is most breeds have applied uh, a positive selection on weaning weight performance. Okay, so they've selected to improve um, weaning weight. Um, you know, Maine Anjou hasn't changed very much. Um, their line's relatively flat. Um, Gelby here has had a slight improvement. Um, Angus um, has the steepest, so um, the one inference of the slopes of these lines is how much pressure they're putting on relative to each other. Um, so Angus has clearly applied um, the most selection pressure for improved weaning weight, um, probably similar to that of Charlet um, in terms of selection pressure, um, but uh, certainly some change in rank. Selection decision, you know, buying one set of bulls, keeping replacement females, and selling calves in the marketplace, um, if you use one set of bulls to do that, you inherit this genetic trend across the population. And that may not be what we want to do. We can control that somewhat by separating those decisions, right? So one of the things I've been um, sort of penciling around a little bit and interested in is how can we use some uh, applied reproductive tools and sex semen to specifically mate a group of cows to produce replacement females and only replacement females? and basically terminal sire mate the rest of the cow herd. And that might be, you know, high growth, high marbling Angus bulls. It might be Charlet bulls. I, we, we can talk all we want about those alternatives. But separating the maternal replacement breeding decision, selection decision, from the paternal or, or marketplace one. And, you know, there's, there's a number of other industries that have already accomplished that, right? So if you think about pork and poultry, they have very different selection objectives and, and decision points for males versus females in those populations. There's some guys starting to think about it, um, and some of them are small and some of them are big. Um, you know, th Leachman's in Colorado very much are talking about this sort of paternal, maternal kind of discussion um, in terms of moderating cow size and and uh, then having kind of a terminal sire system for the rest of it. So there's, there's some opportunity. And you can largely do that paternal-maternal thing, even just looking at the relative differences between breeds and what breeds you use as inputs into various parts of your mating system. Okay? Um, would it make sense to make a whole bunch of uh, Charlet F1 cows to keep as replacements? Probably not, but, I mean, you could do it. Would Charlet make an, a, a great terminal sire attribute to a lot of cows because of growth and performance? Yeah. So, I mean, none of this is rocket science, right? Um, we just got to think about judicious and appropriate use of breed difference. Okay. Um, we talked about mature. Um, you guys have probably all heard this argument. The reason we have big cows is because we use EPDs. Okay. That argument has just as much validity as the guns kill people, right? It's how we use the tool, okay? Um, selection works, um, but so does correlated response, you know? If we select for increased weaning weight and yearling weight, we don't simultaneously select for either reduction or maintenance of mature size, guess what happens? We get big cows, okay? So um, we've got to be careful on how we use the tools, and again, increase performance. Um, one of the really common questions I get about um, uh, EPDs, and particularly if people are thinking about moving outside of the trait maximization paradigm, which hopefully more and more people are, they have trouble figuring out how to connect 
the level of genetic merit of the bulls they've been buying to the phenotypic performance of their cows or of their calves, either group, cows or calves, depending on which trait you're looking at. Well, this is, again, one of those really simple things that's pretty effective that, that people just don't think of, okay? One of the easiest things you can do is take and, you know, if you've got three bulls walking around in your pasture, go look up what their EPDs are for weaning weight. They're going to sire about the same number of calves, roughly. There's going to be some differences depending on who's dominant and who's not. Don't worry about it. Average those EPDs. <coughs> Come up with what the average weaning weight EPD is your bull ba- of your bull battery is. Okay? Guess what you connect it to? What is the average adjusted 205-day weaning weight of your calf crop? Or if you don't have any data to do this, just what's the average weaning weight of your calf crop? That ties, remember the fundamental problem of uh, in a lot of people's view, is the EPD tells us the relative difference between you know uh, this average of 47 and a group of bulls that average 25, but it doesn't tell us anything about what the level of performance in their herd is. Okay, and that's their argument for not using EPDs. Well, we can fix that really easily. This makes the connection. Okay, 47 gives us 560. So if we go out and we want to select for um, adding weaning weight to our herd, and we pick a new bull battery, let's say. Um, 57 pounds of weaning weight performance, what do we expect this number to do? It's going to be 570, exactly. Um, If we take this to the mature cow level, we could relate yearling weight average to average cow weight and make some selection to change that. Okay, yearling weight in this case is a proxy for mature weight. Um, We haven't collected, not many breeds report mature weight EPD, but it would be really useful. Okay. are EPDs the only things we need to select for? No, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's really important that we don't have any tools from the genetic perspective to fix. Um, I want to spend time um, uh, really talking about uh, selection index. Okay, um, One of the things that most of our producers really struggle with is putting the appropriate amount of weight on traits that are of economic importance in their production system. Okay, um, you know, I used to, to on, on occasion, get a call from somebody trying to pick out bulls, and we'd spend time going through the catalog, and I'd tell them, look, make a decision about what your breeding objective is, sell cat, how you keep replacement female, you know, the whole dialogue. Go through and, and in the catalog, rank the bulls, make a short list of bulls that, that you think fit your criteria, call me back. Okay, so I'd scrounge around, find the same catalog, go through the exercise with them. Well, invariably, in almost all cases, they get sidetracked on, you know, scrotal circumference EPD or you know some actual performance record. You know, they get way off track. And the the challenge is is that in so many instances, there's so much more information available than what they actually need. They they just struggle to get through that exercise. Okay, and so one of the things that, that I think really helps us do that is, is selection index. And so we heard uh, some discussion about $B and $W a little bit ago. And I think uh, those tools um, can be really useful um, to help keep producers having appropriate economic weightings on the traits that are of importance. Because in those indexes, you know, if, if it's not an ERT, it has zero weight in the index. So it, it keeps them on track in terms of putting selection pressure where it needs to go. Because the reality is, is that if you've got you know, 14 or 15 traits that you're trying to select for simultaneously, you're not going to make progress in any one of them. I mean, just go someday for an exercise. Go to the Angus or whatever your favorite breed's website is and put in, in their EPD or sire selector tool, put in breed average in every category. Tell me how many bulls you get. If you want a bull that's above breed average in every trait, it's going to be pretty close to zero. I mean, it's really difficult to find genetics that rank in the top half of the breed for every trait. Okay, um, so that it's kind of a point of you won't make any progress. Um, what you need to do is apply selection pressure on the traits that are important. Um, that gets a little complicated because we don't have a lot of great tools for reproduction. But, you know, in almost all the analysis of, of farm-level data, um, the relative importance of reproduction to growth to end product is at least this, okay? And this is an integrated firm that retains ownership and sells calves on the rail. Reproduction's twice as important as growth or carcass. And in this case, <clears throat> you 
in these vertically coordinated systems, these two have the most emphasis they will ever have. Okay? If we think about a more typical situation where you sell weaned calves, um, this stays at 1, this goes to 5, and this goes to 10. Okay? So it tells us that, you know, at, at the very least, reproduction is twice as important as growth or carcass, even in the most coordinated system. Okay? Um, so we need to be careful on, on what we select for, and, and Selection Index does a good job of helping us sort that out. Um, the thing that um, um, Selection Index, I think, is, is really useful for producers is if they pick an index that matches their breeding and marketing objective most closely, um, is, is a pretty effective strategy. So if we think about selling calves at weaning time, um, should you be selecting bulls on dollar beef or dollar W in Angus? So dollar W describes differences in value at weaning. Dollar beef describes differences in value through both the feeding and carcass segments. Okay, if I sell calves at weaning time, which one of those is the right index? Dollar W, right? It's tied, the weightings in that index are tied to selling calves at weaning time. Um, and so getting, um, you know, that marketing endpoint provides a nice place for us to, to focus in on from an, an index standpoint. Um, one of the, the trends I've observed recently is that many producers are actually using dollar beef as a tool for selection and commercial cow-calf operations and keeping replacement females, okay? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, it depends. It's a good idea if you want bigger cows that marble better and produce heavier carcass weights. Because it's a terminal index. It weights growth and carcass performance almost exclusively. With minimal weighting on calving ease, maternal calving ease, maintenance energy requirement, milk, any of those things. Okay, So getting the selection index tied back to um, your breeding objective is the key. Okay, um, One of the things I always find really interesting is you know, selection index application in the beef business is relatively recent. The original paper came out in 1943 on selection index. Okay, um, it's, it's not like we're real fast on adopting this technology, but it can be really, really useful. Um, and all it is, um, and if, if you haven't been uh, following the, the trade literature recently, um, it's simply an economic weighting of the EPDs, okay? Um, you know, here's, a, here's a whole bunch of EPDs that describe variation in dollar terms of some trait. These A's, A1, A2, up to AN, um, are dollar values, and the, the magnitude of them represents how much variation, how important they are in achieving maximization of this revenue, typically, is the, the outcome. Um, and so for traits that are important, these have big values. Um, and for traits that are not economically relevant in the scenario, they're zeros. And it's just a matter of weighting them and adding up the, the result. Okay? So it's not uh, a particularly complicated strategy. Figuring out what these weights are, though, is relatively complicated. Because it says, what is the value of, say, a one-unit increase in calving ease EPD? All other things held constant. Okay? So there's, there's a, little bit of, a little bit of higher math in, in figuring that out, and some, certainly some economic. Um, I want to spend the, the next few slides, and, and I want to leave plenty of time for questions, um, talking about sort of this transition of um, disjoint information from EPDs and DNA markers to a system where that data is converged and leveraged um, in our production systems. Um, so what a DNA marker tells us is, is basically what's the association between a specific variation in genomic sequence, the marker, and some phenotype or breeding value. Um, so all it does is track a genomic region that's been shown to have an effect on some particular phenotype, and that's all it does. So it might be, um, this might be a, a, a weaning weight um, uh, quantitative trait loci, and the markers describe, say, a, a plus four or minus four um, influence on weaning weight. That's all it does, okay? Um, the challenge with that, as I pointed out before, is that only describes a very small amount of the variation in weaning weight. There's a whole bunch of other genes that affect that trait. And unless we produce a marker panel that accounts for those, um, we have a very difficult time explaining all of the genetic variation associated in that trait, okay? Or with that trait. Um, we also talked about the EPDs, right? They describe 
the way they're calculated, the net effect of the interactions of all of the genes that affect weenie weight. Okay? So there's a part-whole relationship here. And we're working to develop technology to converge those two sources of information. They're, they're related but different. Okay? One's the individual pieces, and the other one is the aggregate. Well, they provide uh, um, data that we can use uh, in genetic evaluation. And um, the, the key thing uh, about using these molecular tools um, is not to make bulls, you know, that have, you know, plus 1,000 winning weight EPDs. It's to improve accuracy, right? One of the things we want to do is change the, uh, the reliability or the, the strength of the relationship between the EPD that we estimate um, on an individual animal and its true genetic merit. That's what we're, we're trying to maximize that relationship. And accuracy is a reflection of that relationship. Okay? And so, in our traditional genetic evaluation systems, the way we improve accuracy is how? Yeah, we collect more data. We collect phenotypes on individual animals, the own performance record. We collect data on progeny. We collect data on collateral relatives. So we start amassing all this information and putting it through the statistical model that relates all of it. Okay? Um, that's how we build accuracy. What's one of the challenges with that? Well, for some traits, it's really expensive. Some other traits... It's really difficult to measure. We think about maybe Warner Bratz or shear force or individual feed intakes. Um, those are difficult and expensive to measure. Um, what about traits like cow longevity? Yes, time to get yeah, time. I mean, time, time is, is valuable, especially on traits um, that are associated with reproduction or fertility. Um, and so, uh, and, you know, stability is a good example. By the time we get meaningful data on a bull, you know, we're using his grandsons um, at the commercial level, okay? Um, so it just takes a long time to collect some of that data. Um, DNA markers provide us an opportunity to sort of shortcut the time frame. They allow us to test animals very young in life for traits that might not be measured in their, in their sex or later in life or expensive to measure. So they provide this sort of proxy data that we can use in our genetic evaluation system, particularly to improve accuracy of, of young animals or selection candidates. Okay, so far and up until maybe the last year or two, um, um, most breeds still operate uh, in a situation where the DNA marker results um, and MBVs that are produced from the genomics companies are separate from the EPDs that are reported by those various breeds. Okay, and that provides a real challenge because there's this disconnect in the data um, and trying to figure out which one is more meaningful, which one will have more predictable results in our selection system, um, is very difficult. It's a, it's a real seat-of-the-pants seat, by, seat of the pants sort of uh, experiment. Um, and we've talked about the differences between these. This one's the sum of all the effects. This one's the sum of the effects we know about. Okay, um, So we're trying to figure out how to, to time those or put those two together. Um, and there's a variety of methods, and I won't bore you with all the, the details on how we do it. Um, but American Angus, uh, I know here in the next few weeks, will have every trait in their genetic evaluation genomically enabled. So they'll be able to use data um, from uh, the two major um, genotyping firms, um, MBVs that result from those tests directly in the genetic evaluation um, to improve that accuracy. Um, so it's, this is a, is a plus in here. This doesn't mean add. This means we're just putting these two pieces together because it's, it's way more complicated than just adding. Um, but we produce these genomically assisted or marker assisted EPDs. And one of the real beauties of this is, is that we leverage the data appropriately from both sources. Do we have to retrain anybody on how to use EPDs? We have to train some people that haven't adopted the technology yet, but anybody that knows how to use EPDs immediately know how to use genomically assisted EPDs. Okay? It's the same currency, the same language, um, just better accuracy. Um, one of the real challenges, though, with these tools is um, getting a feel for what is the amount of genetic variation the marker panel explains and how is that related to improvements in EPD accuracy. Okay? And the, the, the bad news is, is that um, it takes relatively high levels of genetic merit. So this, is, um, this correlation is on a scale called, it's on the correlation scale R. Um, one of the measures of accuracy is called R squared, and it's, it's this number squared, okay? And it's, in, 
animal breeding speak, um, it's the, the, um, the theoretical value of the correlation between the true value, the animal's true genetic merit, and an index of it, or the EPD. Okay, that's accuracy on the R squared scale. Um, it also is the same, it has a direct connotation and connection to the amount of variation in genetic value explained. Okay, um, so if we think about uh, an animal with an accuracy of one, that EPD describes perfectly the variation we um, uh, see between that animal and another animal, say, with accuracy of one. Okay, um, we use in, in the beef industry, we use a transformation of this R squared, or transformation of that, um, to report accuracy to producers. Um, and this is kind of funky because um, what you see is it's a very conservative estimate of accuracy. Um, these numbers um, are much smaller than the squares of these. So this, if you put a decimal point in here, is 0.7 squared is 0.49. That's R squared accuracy or percent GV um, is much bigger than this. Okay, And you're probably going, well, why in the hell did we do that? Well, there's a, there's a nice feature of BIF accuracy. And it's that um, um, as we change um, accuracy level, say, from a 0.2 to a 0.3, um, there's a linear change in what's called possible, or there's a linear um, change in possible change, or the standard error of prediction for the EPD. Um, and so early on, the vision was to use BIF accuracy and possible change values to build confidence intervals around EPDs. And that's, if you've used um, possible change, um, it provides a nice tool to get a, an idea of the range a particular EPD, the true value, lives in. Um, if you go and look in the tables and you go from a 0.2 to a 0.3, that amount of change for the possible change value is the same as if you go from 0.7 to 0.8. Okay, it's linear. It's just completely additive. But if you look at possible change on another scale of accuracy, it's nonlinear. Okay? Um, but the metric we use in the beef industry is this BIF accuracy. And what we see is if you've got a pretty good panel, um, uh, the panel has a genetic correlation with the, the EPDs of 0.7, it describes about half of the genetic variation. But when we transform that into a, a level of accuracy we would get by just using the MBV as a predictor of genetic merit in our evaluation system, we only get a BIF accuracy of about 0.29. Okay? That's about the same equivalent accuracy as an animal's own phenotypic record being included in the genetic evaluation system for a trait like weaning weight. Those animals typically have accuracies about 0.3, depending on the heritability used in that evaluation. So you know, there are no um, marker panels available today, except for one trait that describe 50% of the genetic variation in the trait. Lots of them um, are down here 20 to 30, maybe 40%. Um, so as we get better and better panels, we'll do a better, better job of uh, accounting for this and building accuracy. Um, I did some math the other day. If we get a panel that uh, accounts for about 95 or has a cor genetic correlation of about 0.95, we can make this accuracy value uh, about 0.6. So we can go on a strictly a DNA test to the equivalent of a progeny proven sire one test. Okay, And there's... Um, uh, real possibility in the next 12 to 18 months that we move from this category up into the 0.8s um, in terms of the genetic value or genetic variation explained in these tests. The reason that's important is, you know, this boost in accuracy going from a, uh, a bull with a pedigree estimate plus its own performance record to the equivalent of having 20 or 30 progeny is dramatic, right? Think about the implications that has on um, selection of bulls at weaning time going into the sale pen at a seed stock operation. Okay, That's a huge difference in the level of information and the resulting accuracy of that decision um, to keep a bull intact or to castrate him. Okay? Um, you know, I think the, 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 the real sort of uh, effect of that is, is uh, if we think about our population um, of beef cattle, we have a tendency to focus on the selection decision that um, commercial producers make when they go buy a seed stock bull. But in the grand scheme of things, that has zero effect on genetic flow in our population, right? Because if you think about the next level up, the seed stock producer, once he makes a selection decision, he sells all those bulls 
they go out and breed cows somewhere. It really doesn't matter where from a, a gen population genetic standpoint. It's just a matter of which one gets assorted to which commercial. Okay, the real change in genetic flow in the industry happens when a seed stock producer you know, gets out the knife, takes the testicles off a bull. That's where genetic change and genetic decision making happens, both functionally and quite literally. Okay, And so doing a better job of figuring out which bulls actually need to be propagated, um, either via AI or into this commercial population, is where all the genetic action is in our population um, and in our business. And changing that, think about you know if we could have um, estimates of cow longevity and mature weight um, on yearling bulls with an accuracy of 0.6, when we go pick them up at sale time, that is monumental. Okay, mental. And this technology at some point will get, will get. One of the key things is to recognize too is that, um, you know, the, the investment um, of genotyping um, needs to be actually be applied to these young animals. That's where all the benefit is in genomic testing. Um, this is uh, uh, EBV or uh, EPD accuracy on the X axis. Um, this is um, that accuracy, but with the genomic data included. Um, so it's the boost, the little gray, light gray box represent the boost in accuracy um, by including the genomic data in these genetic predictions. What you notice over here is, you know, AI bulls that are 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 accuracy. Test doesn't do anything because the EPD already explains a whole bunch of that variation quite reliably, okay? But it does do some improvement down here, and this is a, um, a test that only describes um, uh, about 10% of the uh, um, genetic variation, so not a, not a very effective test. Um, here's one that describes 40% of the genetic variation. So an animal without even its own phenotypic record included in the evaluation now has an accuracy above 0.2, um, which is, for a lot of traits, pretty close to their own performance record. Um, you know, here's one that's 0.2. Point three, we still get pretty substantial boosts, even with a panel that's not very good. Um, so there is some real opportunity for us to, you know, as we think about, you know, moving to um, somewhere around 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.6 accuracy by just doing the genomic test. Um, I think it will dramatically change our selection decisions for a whole bunch of traits we can't effectively select for now. Okay. Yep, that's the last slide. So um, I'd be glad to answer answer any questions. Um, I, I will, if, if you're comfortable in this scenario, providing some feedback on sort of level of material for the next go around, that's good. If you want to shoot me an email um, saying, hey, that was too complicated or not complicated enough, um, I'll appreciate that too. So, in stay. In 12 or 18 months, you think that would go from that 0.2 to 0.6 or whatever? You think in five years, you're going to have to go from 0.6 to 0.8? I don't think so. Um, we're going to get to a point where, um, you know, the there's there's a whole. I just spent two days in a meeting talking about all these challenges we have with the the genomic data and how making sure our expectations of the outcomes from that are are, are realistic. And part of our limitation on making that big improvement is the tools we're using to make the improvement. Okay, um, the, the DNA marker panels um, uh, have some inherent challenges the way they were designed. Um, and particularly, um, we think about you know, the SNP50 or the 50K chip that we use as sort of the, the gold standard, if you will, right now for research and discovery in beef cattle. Um, that panel was actually constructed with the premise of there's going to be uh, a polygenic model, so there's going to be gene, multiple genes that affect a trait. But the assumption was is that there would be a number of traits that had major effects on a particular trait, and we'd be able to capture those and find them um, with the kinds of markers and the allele frequencies on the chip. Well, it turns out that I mean, we've constructed some relatively large populations, you know, four or 5,000 animals, and the best we can do is describe maybe 30 or 40 percent of the variation in the trait. Well, part of that's because the markers aren't, A, close enough together, or in what's called linkage disequilibrium with the trait of interest or the gene of interest. And so LD describes the correlation between a particular marker difference and a functional difference in a gene that we can detect. And if those two things aren't in 
um, pretty similar allele frequency, we can't find it. So the current uh, panel is designed so that there's a, a percentage of markers that have uh, our, uh, their minor allele. So the legal allele that's the most rare in the population has a frequency of 5%. Well, in, in, the, in the scheme of genetic variation, that's actually quite large. Um, and so to find these really rare um, uh, variants in a trait, you might need allele frequencies of 0.01 instead of 0.05 or 0.001 um, to find those that are um, really rare in the population. So there's a whole bunch of you know, really technical stuff that affects our ability to find variation at the genomic level. The good news is, is that there's a transition happening now between the 50K panel and a higher density one, the 770 or 680 panel, depending on what you use. So it's 770 markers per animal. So about a 13-fold increase in, in marker density. But using that information actually is a stepping stone to actual genomic sequence. Um, you can actually get genomic sequence on a bull now for about $5,000. Um, if you do them in volume, you have about $3,000, which still sounds like a lot of money. But the beauty is, is if, you know, in a population like Angus, we might need to sequence 50 or 60 bulls to figure out what all of the genetic variants are for a particular gene in the population with reliability. We can use the marker panels actually to, because those blocks get inherited in big chunks to progeny, we can actually use the DNA markers to impute or figure out what the sequence is of animals that weren't sequenced. Um, and likewise, we can use a lower density panel to figure out the genotype at a higher density panel with pretty good reliability. There's some algorithms out there that I've been looking at recently for a commercialization project that if I genotype 5,000 markers, I can predict with 96% accuracy their 50K genotype. And there's a big difference in costs about it two-fold cost difference between those two panels. So, um, you know, the next, you know, as much progress as we've made in the last two or three years, the next two or three years are going to be pretty remarkable in, in sort of our change of thinking about genomic architecture and how that influences our selection decisions. Um, kind of on that note, one of the, the speakers at this conference has been doing a lot of work with sequence. He's a faculty member at Iowa State. And he'd been to a meeting in Canada, and they'd looked at um, um, annotation of sequence for dairy bulls. And what they found is in a whole bunch of those animals, um, they either had a broken stop, a start code on or stop code on on a particular gene, which makes it completely dysfunctional, unfunctional. And so, you know, there'd be you could go through and, and find animals that have, um, you know, complete sets of genes for a trait that might have three or four genes that are completely broken, um, that don't get expressed correctly. Um, and so there's, you know, having sequence data gives us a, a, a much different perspective on, on genetics than, you know, having just a bunch of marker data. Wow, so. that, that brokenness, is mm -hmm. that something that's passed on to progeny? Oh, absolutely. They stay in the broken state? Yeah, they stay in the broken state. So um, you could think about, um, and, and broken is a relative term, right? Um, a broken gene actually might confer a favorable phenotype. Okay. Think about myostatin, for example, um, the double muscling uh, gene. Um, the, the normal state of that allows an animal to regulate muscle accretion. The broken state of that gene makes them you know, double muscled. Um, so you can think about, you know, there are some of those variants are very undesirable and some other ones that are very very desirable. So, but it is that, that brokenness gets transmitted just like all the other genetic material from parent to offspring. Yep. Anybody else? I'll try and give a less involved answer next time. Promise. <laughs> yeah, I saw the eyes rolling over here. <laughs> I guess this question can go to all three of you. As we trend towards Bee deficiency, mature cow weight, body condition score, that's where we're at as agents in terms of doing training to our producers. What's the next thing that we need to be looking at down the road? Um, it's a good question. The Casey, you want to take a, take a first stab at it? Well, honestly, I, it is. What... Uh, 
But the, what I was thinking when, when Bob was talking about the great leaps forward that are likely in, in the fields of genetic selection in the next three years, is I'm going to be out of a job. If it takes, if it takes no management skill to, to build the right cow, to build the right cow for the right environment, I can just look at a catalog and I can pick a sire and know with reasonable level of certainty that that sire is always going to throw the daughter that will perfectly fit my operation. I'm out of a job. But that's taking a cow to farm. Yeah, I, I would argue, Olson, you're not going to be out of a job because <laughs> a whole bunch of the traits that are of economic importance have huge environmental variants. So we had a, actually a discussion on feed efficiency at this meeting um, out in the lobby to the same same end is that you know there's a whole bunch of things we can do either technologically in terms of diet pharmacologically in terms of you know supplemental um, growth promoting implants um, you know ionophores the whole list of things that if you take those out as a block you know accounts for you know a couple hundred dollars uh, of added value in our production system I, we can't make that up in selection for feed efficiency there's not enough genetic variation in the trait to fill that gap. So there's still going to be a huge necessity for people, you know, figuring out the man the appropriate management application and the appropriate genetic application. And I think a really interesting piece of science is the interaction between those two. Okay, so we can think about like market management. How do you manage animals in a feeding setting or a harvest setting based on genotype? Yeah. Some inter interesting stuff. My part of that answer would be what I just handed around that relates to fetal programming and epigenetics and whether how long it's going to take us to figure out how that fits into what we know of what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. What, what environment to provide at what time. Yeah. yeah. There is a couple of um, um, other sort of things coming down the pipe on the genetics end. One is that there's a big um, USDA funded feed efficiency project um, going on that I'm involved with. Um, primarily on the extension side. Um, and there's another project that just started on um, genetics uh, and management strategies to reduce BRD or BRDC, depending on how you say that, but animal disease component and so response to immune function, response to vaccination, all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm historically, although the last few minutes probably aren't really good evidence of that, I've been a very sort of conservative genomics person because the old tools work so well, right? And they're low cost. Um, but finally, our genetics and genomics stuff is getting focused on traits where the genomic tools can really shine. I mean, we think about feed efficiency as a trait, BRD as a trait, um, those things that are, you know, we're never going to collect piles and piles of feed intake phenotypes. You can't do it. Um, a bunch of these disease phenotypes or reproductive phenotypes, we won't collect lots of those. And so the only chance we have for improvements through um, DNA selection, marker-assisted selection. So. Well, I'm concerned that you two need to be driving peace and not get yep. attention of certain... Lay State Patrol? Lights. Yep. And so we, we certainly thank you both for being part of our program today. And yep, thank you. Yep, we still are recording here. Yeah, we'll, we'll we can.